Dear students and colleagues, uh, uh, welcome to the third webinar of the Innovation Talks uh, 2021 of the Lumsa University in Rome. Innovation Talks is an important initiative, uh, a cycle of webinars aimed to discuss innovation, uh, technology, sustainability, and the future of business in society with expert and opinion leaders in the uh, business community and in the innovation community. Innovation talks are organized by the Department of Law, Economic, Politics and Modern Languages and the Master's Degree in Management and Finance in partnership with the Association of Alumni LUMSA. I'm Filippo Giordano. Uh, I'm the Program Director of the Master's Degree in Management and Finance. And uh, I'm here to say you uh, a warmly uh, welcome. Uh, this edition of uh, Innovation Talks is focused on the relation between humans and technology. Uh, in the first webinar, we hosted a talk about augmented reality and the impact on our life. Uh, in the second, we talked about ethical challenges of new technologies with a focus on artificial intelligence. And today we are going to debate about robots uh, and the critical issues re uh, related to the interactions you know, between humans and, uh, and robots. Um, so I immediately uh, leave the floor to my colleague, uh, Leonardo De Cosmo, that is uh, the scientific coordinator of this initiative this year, and uh, uh, he will share uh, the webinar. Thank you, Leonardo. Thank you, Filippo. Thank you, too. Uh, so thank you. It's, uh, it's an honor to, to, to me and to us uh, to have here Alessandra Schutti. She's head of uh, uh, Contact Unit, the Cognitive Architecture and Collaborative Technologies Unit uh, of the Italian Institute of Technologies in Genoa. Uh, she's uh, she, she's uh, our new guest in this new innovation talk. Um, I'm here with some students of uh, Digital Transformation Lab. Um, Alessandra, uh, robots are, uh, are a technology that completely changed uh, manufacturing, but industry at all, and also our life in part, not, not at all at the moment. Uh, but robots anyway are still evolving. And one of the biggest challenge uh, in robotics is make them uh, able to cooperate with humans, uh, the cobot. So uh, thank you, Alessandra. Uh, I leave you the, the screen, the stage. I don't know how, how we can call it now. So thank so, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is actually a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, yesterday, I'd like to take this occasion to talk a bit about this idea of robots, what they are today, what they need to become to be tomorrow. And I will be sharing with you a few slides. OK, now I see you are seeing them. And uh, actually, I'm, as, as, um, as nicely introduced, I'm the head of the Cognitive Architecture for Collaborative Technologies Unit, which means that we are dedicating our research effort in uh, um, creating cognitive robots. Robots that are able also to establish a shared perception with us. So, in other words, to establish a mutual understanding. But um, before discussing about uh, this particular aspect of research, I want to try and convince you that this is what uh, we really need for robotics for tomorrow. So, since long time, uh, there is this nar narration of robots being among us. And uh, um, it's uh, omnipresent also now, but uh, since the very first introduction of a robotic arm into an industry, uh, writers have started considering, well, robots are among us. And uh, this seems uh, a bit at odds with our everyday experience, but on the other hand, it is actually a true claim. Because if you think of the car you drive or uh, of the uh, telephone that you're handling or your computer, big parts of all these devices have been actually produced by robots for you. And this is the kind of robots that we're discussing about. However, in the minds of all of us, when we hear the magic words robots are among us, this 
is the kind of robots that we are figuring out. So robots that are not segregated in an industry are not big bulky machines working by themselves somewhere, but rather that have a pervasive role in our everyday life and uh, which are agents with whom we can interact pretty naturally. Let's say as if they were our neighbors or our friends. Well, we can easily say that this is not what we are envisioning now. At the moment, these are not the robots that we are meeting along the street. But on the other hand, um, even the research has understood that the domain of interaction is actually crucial for robotics. And it is crucial also for those fields which traditionally um, have seen robotics as something autonomous per se, without the need of any interaction with humans. So let's come back to the industrial application. Yes, even in industrial application, now the vision is not anymore of a big bulky machines that uh, um, expert operators need to turn off when they are around, that they are um, bulky machines segregated in cages that do and produce always the same product in million copies by themselves, but rather there we are aiming at a paradigm shift toward the cobot, the collaborative robot. The idea is to have a robot that can uh, work at least in the shared space with a human. The, the goal in the long term is actually to do also a step forward to have a robot that can actually collaborate, exchanging also forces, and working together with uh, uh, the human partner. And the idea here is really that of balancing and combining the uh, infatigability, the robustness, the precision that a robot can offer with the incredible ability that we humans have to deal with unexpected uh, scenarios or events, and also to learn a new tasks and adapt very fast. This is really crucial in an economy that now doesn't see just very big mass production as its own objective, but rather has turned toward personalization and the constant need of changing procedures and products over time. So even in industrial application, we realized, well, interaction matters. Interaction could be the solution because we cannot yet build robots that are as versatile and adaptive as humans are. But that's not the only field. Even space, space, uh, spatial exploration have always seen robots as actors. But again, robots were teleoperated maybe from Earth. They didn't have to interact with people. Now, even the research in the field of space application in research in robotics, um, is looking at the importance of establishing an interaction between robots and astronauts in this case. And so a lot of different platforms have been devised to actually be there and support uh, the astronauts in the International Space Station, for instance, in their daily tasks. And emergency. Again, dealing with emergency scenarios has often been ascribed as a typical robotic duty. Um, and what we were thinking there was mostly robots that need to work alone uh, through the breeze in uh, um, dangerous zones, again, alone. But uh, the recent unfortunate uh, occurrence of the pandemic showed us that even in the situation of emergency, having the possibility of having machines that have up to a certain point an ability to interact with humans could have brought so many advantages to us. So even in the context of emergency scenarios, robotics is looking at interaction abilities as something that cannot be forgotten. So on the one hand, we have realized that the traditional fields that have seen robotics uh, as devoid from interaction actually would benefit a lot from knowing a little more about interaction. On the other hand, there are a lot of fields that are gaining more and more importance nowadays in robotics that have uh, interaction really as a target of their effort. And I'm talking about robotics for telepresence, 
robotics for uh, tasks that are related to everyday life. Uh, let's imagine, for instance, the self-driving car. A self-driving car needs to interact a lot, needs to avoid, uh, you know, killing pedestrians, for instance, needs to interact with other drivers. So it is inherently very social as a task. And of course, all robotics that is used for rehabilitation or for assisting during education. In all these fields, uh, robotics and interaction are strongly intertwined. So, I think that this puts very clear the fact that for robots of tomorrow to be effective, we need to solve the problem of interaction. And one might imagine, well, not such a big problem, <laughs> just uh, since we are children, we are very good at interacting. So even before developing the ability to speak properly, we can coordinate quite well, both with our peers, especially also with the caregivers, so we're pretty good at it. So can we uh, leverage on the advances in uh, artificial intelligence and uh, in robotics that we have witnessed in the past few decades and uh, easily get access to this coordination and interaction abilities? Well, unfortunately, no, <laughs> the answer is no, because uh, yes, we have seen that uh, now uh, artificial intelligence have done leap forwards in terms of solving logical tasks of increasing complexity. And we have also witnessed robotics and humanoid robotics uh, make literal leaps, um, doing backflips, jumping, and a lot of athletics. On the other hand, whenever we have seen a technology face task which involved an important component of interaction or social abilities, in most cases, we have seen them fail. But how is it possible that a robot that can really do a backflip is not as well able to guess when it is the right moment to, I don't know, hand over an object or to shake a hand? Well, it is actually a paradox, and uh, there is even a name for it, it's the Moravex paradox, which means that, uh, in, in easy terms, that what looks uh, complex to us as humans is actually relatively tractable by machines. Vice versa, what is easy for us, what is, looks immediate, uh, child's play, literally, for us, it is incredibly difficult to pour this to machines. And this is actually what's happening for interaction. And yeah, the, the, the guilty, it's, it's us, it's us humans. So we, we say that this interaction is easy, but it is not, not at all. The fact is, is that all the heavy duty, all the work is already done by our brain. So um, when, uh, whenever we are seeing something, our environment, uh, our partners, uh, people around, um, our brain is already shaping our perception, our cognition, in a way that forces us to focus on what really matters and disregard what doesn't um, to obtain an effective interaction. We have bias at the perceptual level, we have deformation at the cognitive level, and all in all, this allows us to have a sense, a deeper sense of what's happening in front of our eyes in a social domain. Let me give you an example. So in this picture here, you see our little robot iCub and Carlo, and Carlo is passing an object to iCub. What the machine sees, it's a movement. What we are seeing is so much more than that, because we notice that uh, uh, Carlo has a goal, passing the object to iCub, uh, Carlo has an attitude. He seems well disposed toward Icon, but he seems friendly, um, also relatively happy. And it has also an attitude toward the object. He's treating it with care. And all of this information, we capture it even without noticing, just by observing. And we can use this information to adapt our behavior toward Carlo when we are in the position of Icon. Icon just senses a movement. And we are so good at doing that. We are not even realizing how complicated it is because we are doing it since the very first days of our life. Since uh, uh, our birth, uh, the human brain uh, provides us with certain predispositions, certain abilities, like reading when another person is looking at us or recognizing faces or recognizing biological motion. 
And we use all this information over and over during our life to understand how best to interact with another person. Um, indeed, we are continuously using a lot of information that we are exchanging, reading and sending to everyone else Every time we do anything, I mean, even now, you're noticing more about my state, my intention, my goals, uh, just by how I'm speaking, by the uh, loudness of my voice, by the way I'm moving my eyes or my hands, than by the content of my word. And indeed, this is not a novelty. This has been already pointed out uh, very quite some time ago by, by Darwin already, that when it comes to understanding what others are doing or feeling, well, actions are, are very expressive, much more than words. On the other hand, this implies that uh, if we want these robots to become effective collaborators in the industry of tomorrow or in our homes in a further tomorrow, well, we really need them to uh, get a sense, dominate this kind of exchange of signals that we, continually, that we continuously use to create coordination. And this is the next challenge for robots of tomorrow. And this, however, is a challenge that robots can help to address. And uh, robots that actually start from the past the idea of having devices that are inspired in some sense from the basic ability of children and that can be used to understand by building exactly how children learn to interact with the world and interact with others and then become as intelligent, also socially intelligent, as human adults are. This is actually the core of uh, um, the, uh, the RoboCub project, which is the European project that uh, now some years ago um, has brought to the birth uh, to ICUB. ICUB is this robot that you see here, is a humanoid, so it looks a bit like a human, and was really built in this very big European project as a platform, as a platform to understand and study um, an intelligent system, so uh, a child that has in, in, uh, in Nutsche already all the capabilities to grow and learn and become an effective and collaborative adult. And uh, an interesting aspect of the project is that uh, it involved uh, many experts from all over the world, and in particular many experts from different fields, because addressing the question of intelligence collaboration and development required not only the best roboticists or computer scientists, but rather also, for instance, expert neuroscientists and also uh, expert developmental psychologists. And all together they spoke to identify which were the basic abilities that a platform, a robotic platform, should have to support this kind of research. And uh, as a result, actually, um, ICUB was developed, which is uh, this, a platform. Now there are more than 50 uh, all over the world, and uh, they are actually used as platform to investigate these uh, special abilities that we have as humans to learn, to adapt, and to interact. And uh, this also was coupled also with a certain degree of success on the media. So now uh, ICAB is uh, um, a robot face quite well known around the world. On the other hand, this, uh, this idea of having a humanoid to, um, as a tool to understand humans proved to be particularly powerful especially when the challenge is that of studying coordination and collaboration. But you might ask, why a robot? If you're interested in humans, why don't you study just humans uh, and draw inspiration from them? Well, a robot gives us additional tools that are complementary to the traditional way of studies coordination because it is controllable. So it is a physical agent that can move in our same environment, act with us on the same object, but on which, as an experimenter, I can control fully both what it does, but also what it perceives. And this allows me to disentangle effectively 
the role and the importance of each and every of these signals that instead in humans are all mixed and intermingled and often work below our level of awareness. And the ambition here is of course to understand these signals to enable the robot to make to properly use them. So on the one hand, reading us when we are expressing them, but on the other hand, also being able to express them to become more understandable itself and predictable, because we trust more robots that we can predict. And the, the path toward the future of robotics, according to us, then passes through these three steps. The first one is understanding humans by leveraging on the use of robots as controllable tools to investigate these dynamics in a controlled way. Then put on the robot what we understand so that they can make sense and use these very same signals that we studied as very crucial to enable collaboration. And last but absolutely not least, um, allow the robot to use of these signals also in, within a cognitive architecture that allow them to adapt and personalize the interaction to each and one of us. Just to give you a sense to, for what I mean about this kind of studies, a concrete uh, example, um, we are recently have investigated, for instance, whether a robot can become more understandable by expressing attitudes. We, with our emotion, immediately express if we are gentle or aggressive. And even without seeing the face, you are very good at detecting this information about my attitude toward you and act as a consequence. And we tried and replicated the signature of this uh, uh, aggressiveness, and it was absolutely not easy. But the beauty was that when we managed to do that properly, we found out that the robot was activating in the brain of the human observer the very same areas that uh, respond when a human observes another human expressing an attitude. And this is important because this means that if you program well a robot and you're careful about it, you can tap into the very same mechanisms that are in place to support human-human interaction, which works very well. And beyond the scientific value of this finding, it has also a very important behavioral consequence, which means that if the robot points at me something in an aggressive way, I will be more aggressive immediately, in the next interaction, even without awareness. And this means that uh, even minor subtle modulation of how a robot performs a very simple act, like passing an object or pointing an object, well, this can really change significantly how the full interaction will unfold. And with a similar mechanism, a similar approach, we can also analyze other phenomena, for instance, and other constraints. For instance, also how trust toward a robot can evolve over time, and other signals, that is, other quantities that the robot behavior can um, communicate through its behavior. For instance, whether, whether an object needs to be treated carefully or not, uh, by the way the robot moves. As I mentioned, this is just the first step. So understanding how we as humans work. Now we want to make the robot or enable it to sense this information when it is interacting with us. And again, to give you a quick example, we have done the DUA here in terms of uh, detecting carefulness. Here we enable the robot just by observing the movement of a person to infer, to learn whether the object that this person was manipulating was to be treated with care or without care, without any knowledge at all about the nature of the object. And this, of course, increases the coordination. And uh, more recently, we have also, um, ex let me just turn off the audio, I'm sorry, voila. Um, we have also evaluated the possibility to communicate through uh, the eyes and we have found out that by monitoring the eyes of a person and the pupil dilation in particular, it is possible for the robot to sense the cognitive load. For instance, the, something that increases very often when we are lying or fabricating a lie. 
Of course, another precious source of information is that given also by facial expression. And we endowed the robot with different methods to have a sense of our facial expressions in response to what we are doing. This is not per se useful in terms of understanding emotion. This would be too much. On the other hand, it has a very important impact in the context of interaction in that it allows the robot to adapt its behavior also to the state of the partner. This is a scenario in which the robot is acting as a trainer or the sort of a therapist. And the ability to see not only the physical performance of the participant during the exercise, maybe the improvement in performance, but also the facial expressions in reaction to particular moments in the game is what enables the robot to be adaptive, not only in the selection of the exercise, but also in the strategy to maximize the engagement and the participation of the partner. And again, facial expression and cognitive load uh, are just a few of the uh, information that can be derived by, just by observing someone acting and interacting with the robot such as uh, are the goal of an action or, for instance, whether the person is enjoying the interaction or is not feeling comfortable about it. I hope that uh, this very fast, uh, um, let's say, exposure or flight through different examples of what can be investigated uh, using the robot has convinced you that this is a cool and a nice tool. On the other hand, uh, I want to underline that uh, these steps are fundamental. There is still a lot to do in this direction, but the challenge is actually ahead. Because uh, now, even when we will have mastered perfectly all the possible signals in isolation, we will definitely need to do something more which is uh, definitely more than just combining and packing together all the skills. What we need is indeed defining a cognitive architecture. So combining this uh, sensory skill, the motor skills that we have studied in isolation, together with other abilities like memory, internal simulation, internal motivation, so as to enable the robot to pick choices autonomously, and especially to predict and anticipate. And I mean, this is a very challenging task. And of course, it's not a novel task. There are more than four. I'm sorry, I might have missed a moment. Sorry. Uh, this is not a novel question. So there are more than 40 years of research ongoing on developing and defining cognitive architectures. On the other hand, uh, if you look uh, at what are the uh, main elements that have come out from uh, this uh, um, research, uh, um, there are still elements missing. So prospection, so the ability to predict and anticipate, which is at the core of cognition in humans, uh, doesn't emerge among the core cognitive abilities that have been reported in the past cognitive architecture. And if we look at the cognitive architecture that have been proposed for robotics, often the objective for them is to achieve this kind of skill. So curiosity, the ability to interact with the environment autonomously, deciding and learning from touching and exploring multimodally. But a very big and important step ahead that we are seeing, as I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk, is that we also need to take into account the social dimension, which is so crucial in the development of children and that has become so central and fundamental for uh, the future of robotics. So a lot of research now needs to move toward this direction. So combining the ability of perceiving and also perceiving in this case social cues, not only the properties of the environment, but also the responses and the behavior of the partner coupled with an internal motivation of the robot to maybe maximize the interaction and to lead to an adaptation so that the robot or the machine learns progressively from me uh, to personalize its behavior to my needs. And this steps passes also through the need of moving beyond vision. A lot of the examples I've shown have focused on understanding others 
through vision, which is of course a very useful and rich sense. On the other hand, we uh, as humans exploit in our interaction a lot of other senses and we couple them together. And so a lot of research is now ongoing on which is the best way to actually integrate all this information. And this kind of research is open and will bring strong impacts also in industry and in the society, but requires, first of all, also novel tools from the, let's say, machine learning and computer science domain, but also some further philosophical reflection on what does it mean for a robot to actually uh, have uh, uh, autonomy and to actually um, be able to properly interact with humans and to properly adapt in the right way to humans with a strong focus on how to make adaptation personalized in order to fit with the different needs that each of us has. The ambition is that of going beyond reality, so of seeing beyond the mere uh, actual a practical world that we see and seeing with the anthropomorphic lens I mentioned before. So uh, seeing a sort of socially augmented reality, but also beyond the here and now, being able to predict and anticipate so as to grant adaptation and prediction. This is a very strongly multidisciplinary effort um, that requires therefore the union of uh, uh, a lot of researchers across world <laughs> in terms of nationality, but also across worlds in terms of disciplines. And uh, in this respect, if you were interested, I, I suggest you to have a look um, at a recent initiative fostered by IIT, but open internationally, which is called the ICOG, and you can find the address here, where um, expert, world expert in the field of cognitive architecture have uh, uh, provided uh, speeches and have discussed on what is actually missing, on how to build a novel cognitive architecture for robotics that uh, would uh, address the issue that robotics is uh, encountering today. And all the videos are available on the YouTube channel. To conclude, uh, I would like to say that the general goal for robotics of tomorrow is to have more humane robots. Where humane doesn't mean at all that uh, robots need to look like humans, um, but rather they need to be considerate of humans, in a sense that they have a model, they need to have a proper model of humans, so as to be able to think or understand how a human thinks, so as to be able to adapt to their needs, be it in the road while driving or in an industry, passing the right tool at the right moment. Um, with that said, I would like just to conclude by thanking you for your attention and thanking all the wonderful team I'm working with and uh, um, who actually produced all the research I described during my uh, lesson. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alessandra. Very, very interesting. And I have a question for you, uh, because you, uh, you said uh, robots can help to understand humans. Uh, you, you just had a few words about trust. And um, how can we trust robots? And anyway, it's not easy. Uh, <laughs> Well, no, that's, that's true, and it's really a core question of the moment, because in the past, robots were actually tools fully controlled by humans, and so the, the question of trust uh, didn't make particular sense. Um, um, it was like trust in automation, so when you trust your car while you're driving, for you to trust it, you need it uh, that it performs well and that it's stable, no, that it's that it doesn't break, you drive and the car just uh, just needs to work. And that's the, the, uh, the trust in automation that usually applies to any kind of machines. But if you look at robots and you start thinking, mm, I'd like it to be a collaborator up to a certain point, it means that you can't control it all, all the time. Then this brings in the need for actual trust. 
So we actually investigated whether uh, when we are interacting with the robot, we rely on it, we trust its suggestion or indication, and whether this trust works as the trust to your car. So it, is it trust toward the automation or uh, is it more similar to trust in humans? Because in humans, trust is so much more complex. There are a lot of social norms that intervene, like reciprocity. Well, if you show you trust me, I will trust you a bit more, even though maybe uh, I'm not really trusting you more, I will show uh, um, uh, more compliance with what you suggest, so that you next time will comply with me. So we uh, run a series of experiments to actually investigate more in depth this, and we notice that actually the robot, even if it is a machine uh, guided by computers and with motors, still um, doesn't uh, um, evoke the same kind of trust that you would apply to a car, but something which is in between the trust that you apply to humans and that to the car. For instance, um, you can have a robot break. There are very, a lot of evidence in this direction, not only from our group, but uh, even if a robot breaks, your trust is often preserved. Whereas uh, if this happens to your computer, eh, then your trust is gone. <laughs> and, and exploring humans, okay, uh, do you see difference between in the, the relationships between robots and kids and robots and adults or are similar? We are similar in the interaction with robots or not? There are differences in um, usually uh, taking about average, let's say, uh, on average, children are more forgiving in a sense that if the robot shows a function that is not perfectly fit with their expectation of how the robot should work, children uh, usually um, are more adaptive or uh, can deal with it more easily, whereas uh, uh, adults tend to be more discontented. However, I have to say that there is a huge difference among individuals. So both uh, that at every age uh, range level, in a sense that um, as a function of what you expect from the technology to be doing, um, your interaction with the robot changed significantly. I have also to say that we have the benefit of having uh, a robot that looks like a child and uh, the way a robot appears have a strong influence, of course, on the expectation that you have toward its abilities or how it should behave toward you. And the fact that a lot of uh, participants who come to interact with the robot um, have the expectation of childlike abilities uh, balances very well with the actual abilities of, of the robot. Thank you, Alessandra. I was asking to the students here if they had many, uh, any questions. And a uh, few lessons ago, I don't remember, maybe last lesson, I, I forget. <laughs> uh, we were talking about robots and I, I showed to the students some, some videos quite old uh, about uh, the first uh, robot uh, by Boston Dynamics. And they were uh, kick, beating uh, the robots to, to show uh, in videos how robots were able to 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 work also in different um, environment and having kicks but anyway uh, a lot of people said when they, they saw the, the video said okay wow it was horrified about violence against robots uh, maybe in the future we will have a lot of robots in our life uh, around us what do you think we will they will have rights like uh, pets i don't know what, what do you think will be the, the interaction in uh, these kind of questions okay so as, as a first uh, annotation on on the empathy toward robots um well i have to say that i understand it in a sense that i'm working with icap since i've been working since uh, now it's more than 10 years you don't and think so like uh, we sometimes kick the icon <laughs> when it doesn't work, uh, no, kidding aside. So even if I know how it works, uh, um, every time I interlock my eyes, so we establish mutual gaze, you know, we look in each other's eyes, 
it's really something that triggers some some natural spontaneous reaction so it's it's a natural um, attribution if you want of uh, of life or of intelligence even though i'm perfectly aware of how this system is working so um the fact that we tend to ascribe um i don't know an experience capability or an identity or even feelings sometimes to, to machines well, this is something that is strongly related to how we humans are made. And however, this could be also an important facilitator in some sense, if we want to establish natural interaction, because um, it allows maybe to think of ways for a robot to leverage on mechanisms that are common to human path interaction to establish an effective communication. For what pertains instead the role in society of robots, well, I think that at the moment the question is still um, too, too is still detached from the reality of robotics today. So it's very difficult for me to formulate a, a, a meaningful answer. What I mean is that uh, this kind of reasoning will will make sense when we will describe robots indeed with an identity, with a self, with autonomy. Um, but um, these are uh, very, very far in the future as problems. So in terms of philosophical question, they are very present. But in terms of what uh, our robots will have in practice when we buy them, well, we are, we are um, absolutely um, far away. So I'm, um, I'm afraid that reasoning already in these terms without knowing, without having the possibility to understand which are the actual limits and possibilities of the device doesn't allow us to formulate a reasonable answer. And for instance, I don't understand uh, uh, Sophia, the robot with uh, um, being given like uh, um, a status of a citizen and uh, this to me it's it's totally totally puzzling and I, I don't think it's the right moment let's say to um th there's still so much to understand and to discover before we can address properly these questions <laughs> <coughs> okay so thank you alessandra Please don't beat uh, IQ. IQ. <laughs> <laughs> I will try and refrain. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much to to have uh, for this very interesting lesson. And so uh, the the next appointment is on uh, next Friday. Uh, we will have a guest uh, is uh, Rafi Chakerian. He's a space designer from the Dubai Institute of Design. And so thank you. Uh, Thank you to all. Bye. Bye. Thank you.